welcome everybody. The, uh, Professor Richard Wiseman, thank you for being here. And also Danny Ratnik, thank you for being here. I'm personally very excited to be here because I have uh, known both of you, either your work or in the case of uh, Danny, your presentation in Chicago in the SOMO Gala. So it was very great. And actually, um, we are going to start with a brief introduce, introduction and then the, I would like both of you to share whatever you have to share with all of the people that are here now. So um, let's start with uh, Professor Richard Weisman. So he has been described by Scientific American columnists as one of the most interesting experimental psychologists in the world today. So it's a great honor to have him here. His books have sold over 3 million copies and he regularly appears on the media. Richard also presents keynote talks to organizations across the world, SOMA included, including the Swiss Economic Forum, Google, and Amazon. He holds Britain's only professorship in the public understanding of psychology at the University of Hertfordshire. He's one of the most followed psychologists on Twitter, and the Independent on Sunday chose him as one of the top 100 people who make Britain a better place to live. So Richard is also a member of the Inner Magic Circle, a director of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, and has created psychology-based YouTube videos that have attracted over 500 million views. He also acts as a creative consultant, including work with Darren Brown, The Twilight Zone, and his television show Brain Games. So in a few minutes, uh, he's going to be showing us and sharing some of his uh, introduction with us. And now we have Danny Rotnick as well. Danny, thank you for being here. Danny is an award winning magician and high school science teacher. In the magic world, Mr. Danny is a regular favorite performer at the Chicago Magic Lounge and performs all over the city for corporate events, private parties, and monthly for the University of Chicago Children's Hospital. In the education world, Danny is currently teaching advanced chemistry and integrated science and recently earned his Master of Science in Chemistry Education from Illinois State University. So again, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. How about if we start with Richard? Uh, thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you. A pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for everyone for, for joining us. And uh, it's nice to see the, the Quikology video there, which uh, that, that particular one was filmed in this room, this very room uh, that I'm sitting in at the moment. So I'm going to talk uh, about a paper that I wrote recently about education and magic and the different types of, of way in which uh, magic can be used in educational contexts. In order to do that, I'm going to have to share my screen. So uh, how do I move this on? There we go. There is. There's, uh, there's a, I think I was seven or eight. Uh, there when I used to used to have hair. This was the first um, uh, magic show uh, that I ever did, and I'm sure we all pictures ourselves a little bit like this. Uh, this was uh, uh, my dad made that magic table, and this picture is very interesting because magicians of a certain age go, "Well, that's Pavel's color changing car, uh, color changing records," and most lay people get very annoyed that the apostrophe uh, is missing off the word uh, "it's" on the table there. So, uh, not a great educational start uh, in uh, in magic. Uh, and then I've, I've carried out various bits of research. I wrote a book uh, with Pete Lamont, uh, or saw today actually, uh, called uh, called Magic in Theory. And so I carried out to say bits of uh, research into it. And most recently, uh, I, I wrote a paper called Country Cognition, which the title is on the screen now. It's on PJ, so it's uh, open access, free access. And that was about magic and education, how magic can try and enhance um, thinking skills, uh, delivery of information, and so on. And I just want to differentiate between four of the areas uh, that I mentioned in that paper and talk very briefly about some of my own work uh, in each of those areas. Uh, so the first one, which I think we're going to hear uh, quite a lot of, I know Danny's very heavily involved in this, is science and maths and magic. So here you're taking uh, often scientific principles, mathematical ideas, sometimes to do with computing as well, and, and putting them into the guise of a magic trick and then often exposing the trick or explaining the method and then the, the science uh, behind it. It goes back a very, very uh, long way, a very long history uh, of that. Um, some of my own work 
and there's looked at that within a, a sort of psychological context because you can do the same. Some magic tricks uh, are based on, on pure psychology, as, as it were. There's an issue, and this will probably come up in our discussions surrounding exposure of that because magicians quite rightly are not very keen on magic tricks being exposed. And the way we got over that in Quakeology, which was the, the, the YouTube uh, video platform I created fairly early on, was to devise illusions often where I created the method, or at least they were methods that no magician would use, so no one would get upset about it. So the little video I have here is the, uh, um, the floating cork uh, video. I don't know if you can hear the, vid the, the sound when I play it. It doesn't matter if you can't, uh, but, but fingers crossed you'll be able to. So here we go. Oh, there we go. So you'll see something amazing, hopefully. People occasionally ask me, is it possible to take an object like a cork, concentrate on it, and have it levitate? The answer is yes. All you need to do is focus your attention on the core. And what you will find is that it continues to levitate. It's absolutely incredible. And just goes to show the power of the human mind. So we've seen that, and now we're going to go backstage, find out how it's done. Is it possible to take an object like a cork, concentrate on it, and have it levitate? The answer is yes. All you need to do is keep on focusing your attention on the cork, and it will continue to levitate. It's absolutely incredible, and just goes to show the power of the human mind. Uh, so, oh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, uh, and I've got the right length hair uh, to be performing that illusion. <laughs> so that, that was the, the, the major driver for it. Um, and uh, it's, it's a nightmare to do, by the way, if you ever do try and perform anything uh, laying down like that, all the angles are wrong and all the physics are wrong. But there, uh, often I've used that to talk about the assumptions we make, how they trip us up, lateral thinking and so on. Uh, and it's not a method that any psychologist is going to use. The, the closest to it is Penn and Teller I did something a little bit similar quite a long time ago uh, with a, a full uh, turn on it but it's it's not something that's ever going to uh, upset magicians so um so we have that that use of of magic uh, to teach science and maths uh, and um, uh, uh, computing and so on there's also skepticism and the use of magic within skepticism goes back a very long way this is houdini uh, demonstrating allegedly how some mediums fake mediums would ring bells in complete darkness and seances and so on and of course, most recently you had James Randi, the late James Randi, uh, who did very similar things and, and exposed psychics. And I've done quite a lot of that work, particularly in the context of fake uh, seances. And at least the theory there is that people um, might believe a, an event is paranormal because they can't come up with an explanation. And then they see a magician do it, they see a magician duplicate it, and therefore think, okay, it's not paranormal, or the magician might expose the, uh, the method. And there's quite a bit of research around how that can help to influence and shift people's uh, beliefs about the paranormal. Most recently in the area, uh, we've, I've worked with um, uh, Jordan Culver and uh, Rick Worth to produce some comics called Hocus Pocus, uh, which look at the history of uh, the paranormal through a skeptical and sort of magical uh, lens and, and talk about some of the methods that uh, uh, magicians use. And then we did some experiments where we gave people those comics versus non-magic comics and so on, and looked at the impact of magic on, on belief change. And that's written up um, in uh, Journal of Science Communication. And again, that's, uh, that's open access. Uh, a third area, probably most sort of um, frequently employed, is where you have some information, uh, whether it's about road safety or how to live a sustainable life or whatever it is, um, sustainable lifestyle, um, and you're using magic to convey that information. And so we have on one side here, Megan Swan, who's now president of the, the Magic Circle, who goes out and does environmental uh, magic shows. Uh, the other side, we have uh, road safety uh, magic shows. So this is a, a kind of spoonful of sugar approach that, that you can deliver that information and it becomes more memorable, uh, possibly or certainly more attention grabbing because of magic. And one thing you have to watch with that, as we've found out, uh, is this stuff called uh, seductive uh, details, that what can happen is the magic is 
too good in a sense and people get hooked on the magic and forget the message and, and that that can be quite challenging uh, this sort of work the closest i've come to that is working with uh, will houston a very good sleight of hand magician on a series of videos uh, called science magic where we take ideas uh, we've worked with chemistry we're out to do a whole load of them and we use magic to convey those ideas I was going to play in a little bit of a video that we did about the Apollo moon landings and again using magic to illustrate some of the key facts and figures about that. So again, there is sound. I don't know whether you can hear it or not. It doesn't matter too much if you can't, but you'll get the idea. So I think if I press this, uh, as I pull up, this is uh, Will uh, in action. The story of how we landed on the moon is truly astonishing. It all began in 1957 when the Soviets launched the world's first satellite, Sputnik. A few years later, the American president, JFK, made a bold announcement. He said that America would send a man all the way to the moon and back again before the end of the decade. In 1969, a huge Saturn V rocket was launched into space. One. After a while, the command module detached and zoomed through space, traveling at thousands of miles per hour. Eventually, it reached its destination. The lunar lander descended. Eagle, Houston, you're a go for landing, over. And Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin stepped out onto the surface of the moon. That's one small step for man. Amazing. They collected some valuable moon rocks and explored the lunar surface. Against all of the odds, they'd made Kennedy's vision a reality. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. With the same mindset, anyone can achieve the seemingly impossible. All you need to do is shoot for the moon. So that's what we, uh, that's what we did. Uh, and then did some research about the effectiveness uh, of that. And it turned out it was obviously a lot more entertaining, a lot more engaging. Uh, the, the, in terms of information recall, because we had a control video which had no magic in it, uh, the same information, actually no difference. So it didn't impact on recall, but did impact on absorption and uh, engagement and, and so on. And that, that's Will doing sleight of hand there, uh, not me. And I think it was about one and a half days to film that. Uh, it's it's quite, um, quite challenging, some of that, uh, that sleight of hand. Uh, and then we also have uh, enhancing thinking skills in the classroom in terms of attention, creativity, critical thinking, and so on. And lots of teachers use magic in that way. And again, some of the research I've done has looked at that within the context of teaching kids magic tricks. We taught them a fairly straightforward mentalism uh, item and then looked at their lateral thinking, creative thinking skills before and afterwards. And compared to a, a fairly standard art lesson to do with perspective, uh, we saw significant increases uh, with the, the magic trick. So all sorts of ways, let me stop sharing my um, screen now. Uh, there we go, up here. Oops. Uh, all sorts of uh, ways in which magic can be used. I think there are challenges. Uh, one of the biggest ones being that often magic, there's secrecy surrounding it. And because if you're an educator, what you want is openness. And so there are issues surrounding that. But I think it's a really fascinating and underexplored area. So that's my few minutes, uh, just giving us a, a brief introduction, some context. Thank you so much, Richard. We are going to be talking more about this in the webinar. Now let's go to Danny. Danny has also, you know, performed for students, you know, uh, to teach them about chemistry. What can you tell us more about that work? Yeah, so I'm uh, very excited that you talked first, actually, uh, Richard, that uh, because uh, my grad school capstone project was about uh, using magic for educational messaging. Uh, so what I did was I wanted to find out how does a magic analogy activity uh, compare to just a story-based analogy. And so uh, I found something very similar where the students found it way more engaging, more fun. Uh, they definitely used those words in a post-lesson survey, but uh, the, uh, they had kind of the same uh, 
they performed about the same on the post test for the activity. So um, I'll talk a little bit about that and kind of uh, what I ran. And also what's kind of great is I did it doing a card trick using sleight of hand. So uh, kind of the same thing. I don't have a video of it, but I'll perform it live for you if you'd like. Um, so um, again, like I just said, uh, just got my master's and why am I telling everyone this? Well, I'm telling everybody, you know, I'm just very excited, very happy. Um, <laughs> That took a little while and a lot of work. So, um, but with the project, I had a chance to look at how using magic in the classroom, just trying to ask, ask for myself, is it worth it? Is it worth uh, doing? And so one thing that um, I did and one of the ways that I designed the uh, project was that it was after giving uh, some lessons on the topics and then I used the magic trick as a review of the content that we had done. So uh, we did it as kind of an analogy analysis activity. So I showed them the magic trick. And then afterwards we said, okay, what parts of it, this was for cellular um, active and passive transport. So how do things move into and out of cells? This was for uh, my integrated science course. And uh, so we asked like, you'll see it has to do a lot with diffusion um, and moving from areas of high concentration to low concentration and how we require energy to do the reverse of that. Um, and it did pretty well helping students understand that, but there were other areas of uh, cellular uh, active passive transport that did not quite uh, make it through in the analogy, um, but the other one did. So the control group uh, that I used was, this, we gave the students a story analogy about uh, the CTA trains in Chicago. Uh, so our school is in Evanston, it's a small private school, and students commute. So almost every student in the school has experience with the uh, commuter trains or the public transportation. Uh, and so that analogy related to them. And that was something that uh, came up as well. I'll talk about that in a bit. So let me do a little uh, trick for you now about sure. uh, cellular uh, active and passive transport. Now, this is just using a few cards here. Uh, hopefully they don't go too, um, too like whitewashed on me. I think the sun is cooperating right now, which is great. So natural light is good, but not when you're trying to bounce stuff off of white. So we'll see what we can do. Uh, so we just have a, a bunch of cards here. Now, the fun thing is they are all the same. So they're all five of diamonds. We're just gonna use a whole bunch of five of diamonds. And I can keep a whole bunch of five of diamonds together because the diamonds are evenly distributed throughout all the cards. Uh, because things like to fill up their space and be equally distributed. But if we uh, add a little bit of energy to these cards, let's see if I can come a little closer and maybe do a, there we go. We'll see how that works. If we can, if I add a little bit of energy and we're gonna do that by shaking, we just give a little extra shake like that. You'll see if we can get all those diamonds to come together on one card. And of course, if all the diamonds are here, then Yes, there's nothing over here as well. So we have all of our diamonds on one card. Now this is kind of unstable if we keep them together because like I said a second ago, all the diamonds would rather be completely uh, distributed. So uh, all we have to do is just put them together and then they will go back to being two fives evenly distributed. Let's see if we could do something else. Let's see if we could put them together and then maybe even add more energy as we go. So we just give a little shake like this, oh, maybe a little more, hold on, there we go. That should do it. Oh, oh goodness. Let's try that again, here we go. There we go, ah, perfect, there it is. And there they go. So now we're back to a 10. Now, of course, this is about as concentrated as a card could get. If you've ever played cards, you know a 10, you can't really add any more diamonds, even though there's kind of an empty space right there. Uh, we couldn't take, for example, another five and put the 10 and the five together. But maybe we can, let's uh, give it a little little try here. We give it a little shake, let's see. Hold on, keep watching that 10. There we go, that extra shake. We got all those 10 to come here. And of course, we put the 10 and five together. Yes, that would be a 15 of diamonds, of course. So uh, now again, very unstable as we've talked about a little bit ago. So uh, we have ourselves uh, two blanks and a 15. 
But if we just go ahead, put them together, you'll see we can get back to three fives, all spread out and much more uh, stable and in equilibrium. Thank you. Very good. All right, thanks. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. So that was the trick that uh, I performed for the students. And uh, so that was the magic group or the experimental group. Uh, the control group heard a story about uh, the trains. And it was actually the train stop at Wrigley Field where the Cubs play. Uh, and so uh, there were moments where the train is very crowded and then the doors open and then people rush out through the doors. Um, and so there was some usefulness to that analogy, especially uh, because it is something concrete that the students could, um, that, that they've actually experienced. Whereas this was kind of really abstract. Uh, about diamonds on cards and probably the only person who has as much experience with cards, uh, the only person who really has experience with cards was me. So um, that was a little bit of a challenge. So if I were to do it again, I would probably find two equally abstract or equally concrete sort of um, effects or analogies to work with. Um, also, uh, when you were just talking, uh, Richard, about uh, that seductive details. There were a few students who uh, in the survey afterwards, they said that they were just really, they just really enjoyed watching the trick and were trying to figure out how it was done instead <laughs> of thinking about what is the content that I'm trying to convey. So um, that is definitely something to uh, keep in mind as uh, we design these. And then the last uh, piece about this uh, that I'm going to try and think about for next time is uh, coming up with an effect that any teacher could perform. So I was the only one in the school who could perform that because I've been doing magic since I was a child. No other teacher has in my school. Who knew? Uh, so I would try to design something that any teacher could do because something that might have upped the engagement factor is having a, another teacher come into your class and teach something because, you know, uh, it's more fun to watch somebody else sometimes. A little break in the pattern. Um, I think that is about it for right now and looking forward to hearing your questions. Okay, so actually I have a question for you, Danny, and then a question for Richard. Uh, I just recall when you were doing this magic trick that I tried to teach the same thing for a neuroscience class. And it was, you know, a headache because as you mentioned before, it's too abstract. So at the time I tried to use videos videos help a little bit because you see you know like little figures coming out and in inside the cell but still not quite as easy what would you say is like maybe the key ingredient in, that makes it different from just watching videos um i think something about it is seeing it live i think being there in person that's kind of cool it, it kind of adds a little more personal more personal connection yeah. Uh, with the students, uh, but also with um, with things like I teach chemistry usually, and so also this is a biology topic. We're talking about microscopic things that we can't see, or things that we'll like never be able to see, like um, atomic orbitals. You know, so oftentimes all we have are analogies, um, and so finding different ways of explaining uh, these different topics is important, and something that. I'm still working on now, you know, I mean, we use balloons to represent atomic orbitals or um, uh, electron domains when we're talking about like shapes of molecules and things we tie them together and it works kind of, um, it's not like, it's not really what's going on, but it, it helps them at least visualize like some bond angles or something. So it's a lot of trial and error and just seeing what, it's a lot of throwing things against the wall, seeing what sticks. Um, and the wall being the student's mind and what sticks is their understanding of the content. Yeah, sounds great. So Richard, probably some of the people who are uh, watching this webinar right now, they are not performers themselves. So what is your take on people who want to be able to take magic into the classroom, but they are not magicians themselves? I think it's very tricky. Magic is extremely hard to do well and extremely easy to do badly. And so one of the, and this is what I was touching on right at the end of the, the, my little piece, as an educator, you want to be authentic and honest, I suspect, and open and sharing knowledge. And of course, as a magician, 
we do the opposite. We don't tell people how things are done. And squaring that circle is easy if it's science magic, where you can tell people what the method is or math magic. But sometimes you can't do that. And, and I think that's a real tension. Um, I, the other challenge is, is about surrounding likability, which is related to that, that good magicians have to be likable. And, and we were talking about this earlier on, that when my friends, uh, the few friends that I have left in my life come round, um, you know, I've never been able to show my friend magic in any way that doesn't make me just think, I know something you don't, I'm not going to tell you what it is, and yeah. we're supposed to be friends. To me, that's <laughs> crazy. Uh, and so I always, all I end up doing is, is normally messing around. So I, I think it's, it's, it's challenging. I think, though, that when you get it right, just in a classroom setting, you know, you, you can get the kids' attention. It's something a little bit different. It's fun. It's another tool. Um, I mean, I, I remember years ago, I did some work on whiteboard animations, you know, where the hand comes on and draws the whatever it is, stick figures or whatever. You know, and, and that's just a different thing. It just engages people a little bit more. And I think magic's like that. It's just something a little bit different. And people go, oh, OK, I'll, I'll give this a go. Um, and certainly that's the response we've had from our, our videos is, is that, yes, you might listen to that story, but you're far more likely to listen to it if something magical's happening. Um, but to get back to your question, I guess, like anything else, you know, you, you learn it by doing it again and again and again and again. And at one level, magic's really straightforward. You can pick up a trick and learn how to, to, to perform it in seconds, um, how to actually perform it in front of a group of people and entertain them and not have them hate you, you know, that's going to going to take quite a bit of, of practice. And there's no there's no shortcuts in my experience for that. So it means that they have to practice if they want to perform, but uh, definitely they can bring videos to their classroom and perhaps use that kind of thing too. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and if it's science magic or math magic, it's easy. If you can then expose the method, it's straightforward. I think that's great. And, and, and that does, it's, it's when you're having to hide that method that now interpersonally, it becomes a little bit difficult. I mean, when I've done, I don't think when I've done stuff in front of classrooms like that, what I've celebrated is the fact that magicians get things wrong a lot. You know, the, 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 when you perform <laughs> magic, you don't get it right the first time. Yeah. And, and often I'll get things wrong again and again and again. And the mindset becomes, let's just keep on going until I get it right, until we get it right. Um, and so those sorts of lessons I find quite interesting about mindset and practicing yeah. and getting things wrong and, 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 and not being embarrassed because you've tripped up. Um, I mean, I, th I think that's the greatest thing I've learned from magic, you know, is, is when you get things wrong, you roll with it because your, your emotions are going to telegraph out to an audience um, so I think those sorts of things I, I find really fascinating as a psychologist. Yeah, sure. Um, before, when you were doing your brief presentation, you mentioned uh, one of the areas, skepticism. I cannot really think of any time in history when education in this area has become more important because now we have internet. So, you know, news is, they go viral in a matter of seconds, right? So there are a lot of conspiracy theories. People have a lot of wrong information. But I have a question about this uh, using magic, because like you mentioned before, you don't want to perform for your friends because it's like you're showing something that they don't know about. It's, isn't it a little bit like, you know, the skepticism work in a way? Yeah, I, I, to some extent, I think it is. I think with good, good skepticism, is about going, hold on a second, what, what else might be going on here? Not taking it at face value. And that is a bit like magic. You know, I think you can present a, a, a trick to any class or group of people and go, let's generate an, an explanation. Somebody comes up with an explanation. Well, great. Let, you know, there's nothing quite so dangerous as a person with one idea. Let's generate another five of how this could have been achieved. And I think getting that kind of expansive thinking is really helpful so that when people then encounter a conspiracy theory or something about the paranormal, they don't just take it at face value. They start to question this. And that's what skepticism is. It's questioning this. Yeah. Why did this person do this research, well, apparently? Or why are they presenting me with this, these facts? What other explanations might there be? Yeah. And, and so on. And, and that, for me, is the value of it. When we did the fake sciences, and I've, I've done hundreds of them, yeah, you know, we never expose the methods uh, there. And we always said to people, let's, let's afterwards, let's just talk about what this might have been. It could have been the spirits, but what else might it be? And I think the value is in getting people 
to think about alternatives, not knowing which one is true, so that when the, something else comes along, they go, hold on a second. Maybe there's another way of explaining this. Okay, true. Danny, so what do you think about when people want to bring magic into the classroom, but they are not magicians themselves? How about asking a magician to do it for them, like yourself, if uh, perhaps a, a teacher or a professor asks you to go to the classroom? What do you think about that, you know, being a guest in the classroom? Um, kind of like I said a little bit ago, that's something that could have affected the engagement uh, factor of my lessons when I went to the other science classes to perform it. Um, that it's something that could increase engagement a little bit. I know having um, guest speakers is usually something that would yeah. capture, help capture students' attentions. Um, I think a video is probably good, but kind of in the same way that like um, maybe showing like a Bill Nye video or um, something along those lines. It's cool, but at some point, it, depending on the length of the video or uh, the content of it and who's presenting it, it could either just have the students completely tune out or it might just be a little something um but they might not feel as connected to it especially if it's magic you know when yeah. um, when magic is on a screen always even if it says at the beginning like no camera tricks i've seen some things on instagram i'm like are you sure there's no camera tricks because that really feel that yeah it's, yeah, yeah. It's not good so yeah. um so if if uh mad part of it is um, the magic piece of it and having the students at least feel that uh, connection to the mysterious uh, then yeah. having an actual person in the room might be more beneficial. Um, for teachers who aren't magicians, um, I've read, I read a couple articles or at least one about uh, how teachers should bring their hobbies into the classroom. So that's kind of yeah. one of the reasons why I yeah. bring magic into the classroom because that's my hobby. It's my, yeah. honestly, it's my passion. Like my passion is magic and I like teaching chemistry. Okay. Um, <laughs> but so finding, so I found a way to bring my passion into the classroom. I have another, the, one of the physics teachers at my school, he's a musician and loves music. So a lot of things he does have to do with music um we have other teachers who are um really into outdoor exercise and outdoor activities and they found ways to integrate that so there's lots of different ways to bring what you're interested in into the classroom if it's um i'm my the point of my paper wasn't a hundred percent like everyone needs to do magic in their class yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of like bring what you're interested in into the classroom but that being said there are lots of easy magic tricks that yeah. you might be able to at least learn and uh like richard said if the goal uh, is to figure out how it's done or do some uh like uh lateral thinking or um yeah. like uh i'm blanking on the word for some reason but uh uh working on trying to figure it out uh yeah. then that's totally fine because even if you present it wrong or mess it up or whatever like the goal is to figure out how it's done and so it's um it's still kind of fun some some do some of your tricks involve interaction with the students or are they more like what you presented to us today because i'm thinking that maybe there is a difference when you do the magic tricks and they involve interaction as opposed to not having any interaction with students yeah um that would be interesting i haven't really looked exactly um one of the other ways i use magic i've used uh one is like a black box activity where again the goal is to kind of think about how it's done. It's the pom-pom sticks. If you're a magician, it's just a, a hold on. I have one down here. I'm getting ready for the hospital show that's coming up. So that's why. <laughs> okay. I, that's what the, that explains this. So you got this thing here and you have to try and figure out what's going on inside this tube. It's like, what is, how is this connected to this, connected to this? And so we just kind of give them a chance to like, they look at it and then they kind of draw what they think is going on inside. They collaborate with each other and try and figure it out. And then even after like we see all this happen, then at the very end, no matter what, I just take it apart and show them there's nothing inside. And that's just another moment of like, yeah, yeah. and a hub. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, anyway, but besides that part, I'm gonna not be a prop comic uh, anymore. But 
uh, the, <laughs> uh, the other way is um, I've done uh, a uh, version of Triumph. That's the magic trick where you yeah, shuffle yeah. cards face up and face down, and then they all go back facing the same way while discussing entropy and yeah, yeah. order. So right. I put something like that into my magic show, but I've also brought that in the classroom. So in that sense, I have a student pick a card. We do that. Yeah. And in that case, it's more of like an anchoring type activity yeah. where um, I'm not really using it to really teach that topic, but I get a chance to, after that lesson, we start learning about entropy and disorder. We talk about like, well, if you flip cards over and over, or you shuffle a deck of cards, it gets more and more out of order as time goes on. You don't expect it to go back into order. And so I show them that it does and they're like, whoa, but then we're like, that doesn't, that goes against the laws of physics. So let's, um, that's why that's magical and we think it's cool. Um, so that's about kind of how I would like bring the students into it a little more. So have them select a card, uh, things like that. Yeah, um, yeah. Way. Well, you know, I had a great chemistry teacher, but as I hear you talking, it's like I'm thinking, how would it have been if you had been my chemistry teacher? Probably would have made a difference somehow because these are very complicated physics, chemistry, mathematics, so abstract that, of course, combining these two things are, you know, a great idea. So I'm just a couple of points, just picking up on a couple of points that were made there very yeah. briefly. Um, uh, one is we're not touching on, which I think is very important in magic, is maker skills. So, so get, getting kids to make the props, you know, hands-on maker skills. Uh, you know, everyone's using you know, time on screens at the moment. I think magic is, is tremendous for that. Second, a, a point that Danny touched on is very important, that just because we love magic, it doesn't mean everyone does. Lots of yeah, people yeah. hate magic. They hate it, and they hate magicians. And, <laughs> and so... You know, if I was in the class and my teacher said, oh, you know, I, I, I love the trombone, so we're going to teach chemistry or whatever it is through the, the, the trombone, I'd be going, oh, my goodness. And, and we have to remember there's lots of people that feel like that about yeah. magic, you know, that they don't share our passion. That's absolutely fine. And my third point to gets back to, to your notion about uh, teachers who haven't performed magic. Many years ago, I was interviewing uh, quite a well-known magician. And they made the distinction between showing off and performing, where showing off is for the good of your own ego and performing is thinking, what do the audience want and need? What's good for them at that point? And I think that really matters in this yeah. context. It's not about showing off. It really is thinking yeah, yeah. does what I'm doing help somebody out there grasp a concept, think critically, whatever it is. And I think if you think in that way, which is quite alien to a lot of magic, uh, a lot of magicians thinking that way. What do I? What does the class need to get out of this, or my group need to get out of this? That that will solve a lot of problems. I agree. I would call that Zen magic, actually, because it's more about thinking about what everybody else needs, not just you know your ego. So yes. sounds really interesting. And the, the, the best magic shows have got no magic in at all. I mean, the the, the best. I, mean, I have this sort of uh, mantra that, that you know everything's better without magic normally. Yeah. So so you know uh, just a close-up magic or something just talking to people and finding out about them if you get somebody out from the audience to help you who is this person they'll be far more interesting than anything you can do as a magician and and just always thinking about that rather than hey look i can fool you and, and i'm yeah. not going to tell you how it's done which is not a great formula in an educational or indeed any other context sure that's true so guys i'm just going to pop some questions from our lovely audience and the first one is related to a skepticism so what are the best ways uh, richard of using magic to enhance skepticism and critical thinking let me tell you just a brief anecdote i tried doing this with my mom and it didn't work you know she was really upset that i was trying to maybe very secretly try to change her mindset so what are the best ways to do this with magic yeah it's a, it's a good well, well first of all my first question would be do we need to change people's minds and, yeah. and do we have the right to to do that and some if if believing in the paranormal makes them happier gives meaning to their lives connects them with other people who are we to to take that away just because we have a different belief system right saying that there are some sorts of beliefs which I think are very harmful to individuals and, and communities. And, and when you're trying to engage there, I think 
understanding why people hold beliefs in the first instance is very important. And often it's not on the basis of evidence. If they were evidence-based, they wouldn't hold the belief. So presenting them with counter evidence often isn't going to have very much impact because that's not how they got into the belief in the first place. Often people hold these sorts of beliefs when they have some kind of need, you know, they've become ill and want to believe in a faith healer or they've lost somebody and they want to believe in the spirit world or it gives them a sense of identity or it allows them to connect with others who believe that and, 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 and so on. And, and for me, tackling it at that very human level has always been, always been orders of magnitude more effective than trying to do it at the evidential level. Yeah. Because I, I think, you know, if, if most folks here at sort of science background or critical thinking, we look at the world in an evidential way, most people don't. Yeah. And, 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 and if you're going to change their minds, you've got to look at the world, how they look at the world. Yeah. Great. So I have a question here, and I apologize if I mispronounce this from Suya Joshi, maybe. I feel this connect, that this connect comes from how in general education learning requires us to engage intellectually with a topic versus in magic we want people to just sit back and enjoy now with educational magic you have to do both which makes it uh, twice hard so in in your experience danny do you think it's twice hard or is there any way to circumvent this probable difficulty um i think it goes back to kind of what we've been kind of saying just a little bit ago about what's the purpose of the effect or the magic trick in the educational context you know the um for example the trick that i did with the diffusion and osmosis and stuff yeah it was a cool magic trick it was fun but afterwards we spent time as a class talking about what parts of that magic okay. trick related to yeah. the things that we have previously discussed in class, what parts were um, the ATP or the energy that helped facilitate uh, or not uh, go do active transport, things like yeah. that. So we spent time analyzing what was going on in the magic trick, not trying to figure out how it was done, but what parts of it related to what we had been talking about in class. And I think that kind of helps. And by pushing students in that direction and to try and focus on that, there weren't really many people that I saw who were trying to ask me, but how did you do that? Or how was that done? Um, which was kind of nice. Um, and I think maybe the setup of it too, um, sometimes uh, just letting people know, hey, like with the, um, the pom-pom, stick the goal of that activity was to try to figure out what was going on inside say hey i'm going to show you magic trick but we're going to try and figure it out versus um, i'm going to show you magic trick and then we're going to see how it relates to what we've been talking about um, yeah kind of setting it up uh to relate to what the goal of the activity is yeah yeah you're right and richard uh from tong lee mentions that one challenge of using magic in teaching is that when magic is exposed, some of the students lose interest immediately. So how to keep a balance between revealing the method and still keeping students engaged? That's an excellent question. And, and it's the reason why most magicians don't give away methods is because all you get is a, oh, okay, and then <laughs> that's that. So I think there's two answers there from, from my perspective. One is, and we, we face this with quackology or through every single video, how do you make the method more interesting than the, in the effect? Because in magic, the method is always, or normally is less interesting. And so, you know, the idea of the floating cork, because there's a million ways you can do that using all sorts of things and, and they're not very interesting. The fact you're on your back and, and it makes it funny. The method becomes more interesting than the effect. And that's what we went with. That was always our mantra with every quackology one. So I think part of it is choosing effects where the, the method is more interesting. And, and that's normally the case with science magic. Actually, the science is actually normally pretty interesting. And the second is when I've been doing this with classes, the difference between knowing a method and being able to perform the trick, they're two different things. And, and so I often say to them, you know, even just getting someone to select a card, 
that's a kind of art form in it in itself. You know, if I if I if I say um, you know uh, um, choose a card. Well, that puts every, all the attention on the choice itself, and it's quite difficult to manipulate people at that point. If you say, hold on to one of these, and as their hand comes out, you look away, then that's much easier to, to carry out certain sorts of maneuvers at, at that point, i.e. there is subtlety and there is beauty to detail. And I think when you just go, it's a bit of thread or a force, boom, it's all gone. Yeah. And you don't realize just how beautiful magic is once you understand it at that deeper level. And I think it, it, conveying that can help with exactly that question. It's a very good question. Thank you. Um, Danny, have you, this is from Nicholas Johnson about using magic as a mnemonic device where you use it to remember the lesson rather than explain it. Because before you were you know, sharing that you use it to explain some of the um, processes that occur in chemistry. How about using the magic more like a mnemonic device to remember the lesson, not just to explain it? Yeah, um, definitely. I think that's definitely something that could be done. I, I've never, I have not specifically de designed uh, one to do that yet. Um, but that's kind of my hope with a couple different things. Uh, like I said a second ago with the, um, the triumph uh, magic trick and talking about entropy, I use that kind of as like an anchor. So like as we're learning about it, as we're talking about it, we keep referring back to that trick. Remember yeah. how it was higher entropy when the deck was shuffled and all mixed up. And then it's lower entropy when the deck is uh, all in order and very pristine and nice. So that, that's one way of kind of doing that. Um, and I think that somewhat worked. Uh, I recently uh, just went on paternity leave and uh, my substitute saw me just before I left do that effect. And then he told me afterwards, after I had gone, he uh, brought out a deck of cards and said like, all right, what's the entropy of this deck? And just like, <laughs> threw it in the air. And the students, uh, they were, they wanted to see a magic trick. Uh, he couldn't, uh, but uh, they did kind of remember. It's like, oh, when the deck is in his hand, it's low entropy. But then when he threw them all over the room, okay. it was high entropy. So there's, there's something to that, at least to, at least to right. make them or make them enjoy. And that was um, uh, Kenan Hutchison is who is my sub. He also does a lot of things on YouTube and uh, really cool guy. Uh, interested in explaining science concepts to the masses. So great guy, um, yeah. very happy to have had him as a sub. Okay, thank you. And related to that question, Richard, uh, Matt Pritchard uh, asked a question or he was more like contributing to this discussion, how to help students see past an explanation. And I remember you mentioned something about critical thinking. So when they watch a lesson and there's magic involved, they say, wow, how? But now, how can they just go beyond the explanation? Maybe use critical thinking or lateral thinking. How can you go beyond the explanation? Again, it's a good question. And, and hello, Matt. And if people haven't seen Matt's videos online, they're amazing. They're, they're wonderful. Science magician, uh, I think, uh, is, is, is Matt's handle. Um, I, I think it, it touches on a really important point, which is why we're doing this. Uh, and, <laughs> and, so I, I would, if I would, were doing it for a class, I think I'd perform something. I would then explain that, that, that method in depth. And then I would say, how can we use this? How can this be used in different contexts? How could it be used at a party? How could it be used in a hospital setting? How could it be used to um, help people communicate better? I.e., what's the point of magic? It isn't just something that can be used in an entertainment context. And, and also, how can that principle, and do exactly what magicians do, how can that principle be used in different ways? Invent five, let's invent five tricks that have never been invented. And, and we know they're going to be terrible, but let's just do it for the fun of doing it because one of them might be great. And it's also quite fun to have people bring their own background into magic. Uh, I, I, I can remember working with some kids uh, and this was when the um, Harry Potter films had just come out and they were, they were placing it all within that context and doing things effect wise that magicians wouldn't normally think of because people weren't thinking in that kind of wizard context at that, that time. So how do you bring 
everyone's unique. How do you bring your background and, 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 and culture and heritage and experiences so that it becomes your little performance piece? Yeah. How can you get as much of you in there as possible? Because you're very, very special. So take Wiseman out of the trick and put someone else into it. It'll become far more interesting. So I'd go down that, that, that route. I don't know if that answers your question, Matt, but that's, that's what I would, I would say. Okay, thank you, Richard. So um, another question, this is from Ian Crawford. Is there a difference between teaching ma with magic for students versus adults? Uh, Ian uses magic to illustrate concepts in corporate training. Um, is that a question for me or, or Danny or anyone? Anyone, yeah. Uh, uh, take that. I've really only yeah, worked on. with, uh, I've only conveyed information to like high school and lower. So for adults, I'm not sure. Okay. I, I've, I've done the opposite. I'm mainly with adults. Um, I spend most of the time apologizing for doing magic to them. So uh, <laughs> I think um, I, I, I don't, I'm not saying there is that much difference really conceptually obviously there's a difference in language and interaction and and so on but conceptually it's it's pretty much the same um and yeah to, to me you know we're passionate about this stuff and my question is why and how do you convey that passion um and and it, it it's not about method it's, it's about the beauty of magic and and the creativity of magic and i think once you get that across adult audiences get that as much as kids Okay. There's something uh, that you just said, um, it's like the conveying the passion. And that's something that um, I never thought about with my own act. But a friend of mine said, like, when you get up there, what you do is you're just excited to show everyone this magic. Like, sometimes, like, I'm just like, hey, let me show you this really cool thing that I do. Um, and so that was something that anyone can bring to their own performance. It's just like, be excited about what you're doing. And that's the same with like teaching. If you're excited about the content, yeah. the students will have a little bit more engagement than if you were just like, like when I teach photosynthesis, like, <laughs> yeah. like I, when I teach photosynthesis, I just pray students don't ask me, why do we need to know this? Cause I'm like, I don't know. Let's talk chemistry instead, you know, but also don't show this. Cause I'm, uh, uh, this is being recorded. Don't yeah, it will it be posted. Before. <laughs> not book not before next semester next semester okay but anyway but if you're really passionate about it it comes through and i think that's yeah kind of I, actually cool. i think you're touching on another very important parallel between magicians or performers in general and teachers which is that we have to do the same thing again and again and again and make it look like it's the first time we've done it and we're still passionate about it. When you've heard every joke, you've seen every card selected, you are still going to get that. Well, I, when I talk about how to give talks, the illusion of spontaneity so that the audience think this is the first time for them. There's nothing worse than thinking, oh, my goodness, this is the 20th year this course has been taught and they're clearly phoning it in and the same with a magic performance. So I think that that illusion of spontaneity or even better spontaneity is, is a really important skill. Um, about that, Richard, uh, you know, when I actually I perform a little bit, when I do it, I prefer something more interactive. That way yes. it's always different, yeah. always different. I, for people so, who heard me talk about the psychology of luck, I've been giving that talk for 20 years. And right at the top of the talk, I always misremember on purpose how long I've been giving the talk. So I always say I've been studying luck for, oh, I don't know, 15 years. The next day will be 17. Then it'll be like 25. I always change the, the, the thing just to kind of wake myself up a little bit and to remind myself <laughs> that, that I shouldn't be just going through the motions. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And Paul Cooper wants to know, uh, using magic to foster skepticism is great, but how do you feel, Richard, about some people using magic to educate us about religious and superstitious beliefs? Uh, well, religion is a different thing to the, the paranormal in my mind. Uh, if you mean, I'm not quite sure what the question means, but if it means using magic tricks and not telling people you're a magician, and, and getting them to leave your religious viewpoint or paranormal uh, viewpoint, uh, I think it's deeply unethical. And, you know, when I, if I have a bad back and I go to my doctor and I get some pills, I don't want the doctor to go, ha ha, actually, I'm, I'm a magician pretending to be a doctor. I'd be furious. Uh, I, I think, you know, stay in your lane, magicians. Uh, this is entertainment. 
it is not up to us to, to stray into the lane of, of other expertise and saying, oh, actually, you know, I, I'm a genuine psychic or I, I, I can, you know, I've got powers from God or whatever. Uh, to me, that's a deeply unethical thing to be doing. Okay. So um, another interesting question here uh, is from, well, actually it's more like a suggestion from Adrian Allen. Once the secret is exposed, get the students to learn how to perform magic for others. Um, how do you both feel about teaching students this? Because this is, you know, giving them away the secret, despite the fact that they are not magicians. Uh, I've, uh, during the course of my research, I found a couple um, papers that um, talked about, or just a couple writings and articles about teachers talking about the benefits of having their students do magic for others it kind of helps uh public speaking it helps yeah. uh, teamwork if they're working together it helps them kind of with that growth mindset of working yeah. something until you get it right and then the um even for me we talk about um formative and summative assessments like a formative assessment is like practicing and then yeah. your summative assessment is when you're performing it you're up on stage that's your one shot to get it right so it kind of uh so teaching students magic has other benefits than just the content that it's trying to get but sometimes like those uh cards that have the numbers on them and the students can guess the numbers like yeah it's cool to teach them a magic trick but it also teaches them how to do some addition in their head so like there's a little bit of um extra stuff that goes along with it okay. I, I i think that's that's all true my i've got to be of empathy for sure. so i'm dyslexic so as a kid the worst thing that ever happened to me, the worst thing was getting me out of the front of a class and asking me to read text. I couldn't do it. And, and so I always think about that when we say to kids, oh, you have to come out and perform magic or perform anything. There'll be kids out there, it's not their skill set. You know, they're, they're introverts, they don't want to do it and, and so on. So my feeling would be to again have some, you know, for the, the kids that want to do it and it will be useful for, for them, that's wonderful. But let's not forget, for other people it's just not their bag and, and they're special in other ways and, and we should celebrate those other ways as well okay. oh for sure I, I love that and it, even so like um at a school that i taught at previously they did a thing with the adolescents the seventh and eighth graders where um it was like a talent show basically but there were a lot of students who ran lights and sound and press yes. and things so it kind of gave them a, everyone a chance to participate in this big production and the kids who want to be on stage got a chance to which is i think that's that's brilliant. that's exactly what i'm talking about that that the, that's what's great about putting on any kind of show you know we need we need props to be made and to be decorated we need other people to do other skill and and coming together to produce this thing for the good of an audience to me is a much uh, bigger and better lesson than an individual showing off I, I i love the idea of every kid contributing what they can for the greater good and also that's one of the weird things about magic too is like we only see like the magician on stage <laughs> you yeah. we forget even as magicians like yeah. performing at the magic lounge it's just a magician comes in they they go up on stage they set up their own stuff they do their own thing we forget that like other magicians have teams and lights and sounds and prop makers and all these people but at this amateur to like different levels like people have to kind of do it all themselves and they do do it themselves because of this weird secretive nature of magic, but we have to work together. And I know Richard, you consult on many things. So like we need consultants. Like I want people to watch my act and tell me how to make it better. Like some of yeah. my best jokes are written by my friends, you know, <laughs> so, like that, so we got it's, it's very stra strange for I me. Mean, magicians are, are kind of so used to being self-reliant for, for exactly the reasons that you, you say, Danny. And, and the good part of that is they're very agile. They, they can change between shows and sometimes even during a show. I, I've consulted on a couple of um, quite big theater shows and it's so not like that. You change one tiny thing and the lighting person goes, oh, it's a day's work. And the prop person goes, now I've got to redo the whole thing. And, and, and you realize what, what teamwork really is in, in theater. Um, so the agility of magicians is great. But yeah, as you say, then, then you try and be your own director, your own prop builder. And, and, and this, is, this is crazy because there are people out there who will do it much better. Great. So we're almost running out of time. 
but uh, since you since you opened this webinar with very interesting ideas and, and both of you did a brief presentation, it would be great to have a home take a, a take home message from each one of you, if, if possible. I'm I'm happy to do that. Um, I would say that we love magic, and remember, not everyone shares our passion for magic. It is a tremendous tool in the right context. It won't be for every, if it's an educational context, child in front of you. And that we, sh we should celebrate everyone's own unique skill set rather than just pushing our passion on people. But in the right context with the right person, I think there's tremendous and as yet untapped potential uh, with, with magic within an educational context. I don't know if this is too personal, but uh, I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, what has been probably the most difficult obstacle, but also enlightened, enlightening obstacle you've found while doing all of this? Um, most, I, I, I suppose, I would get back to some of the questions. People will think they want to know method. And when they know method, it's really disappointing because that's not what makes magic beautiful and fascinating. And so the obstacle is overcoming that little hurdle and showing people what's really beautiful about magic. Okay. Okay, great. How about you, Danny, your take home message yeah. and maybe any difficulties that you can share and how to overcome it? I'm trying to kind of think of those. I think Richard summed it up really well. I mean, um, bring magic into your classroom if that's what you want to do and that's something that you're interested in. That's something I'm super interested in. So that's what I've been studying and doing my whole career. Um, but also bring your own passion into whatever you're doing. And I, I, um, I'm i trying to think of uh, something that was has been challenging. I mean, it's, um, I think what was, Odd, like the most challenging thing for me was um, before I became this Mr. Danny character who talked about chemistry on stage. I was just a guy, I was just another magician, just going up on stage, talking real fast, saying jokes and doing magic. And then um, thankfully that I, I'm sorry to name drop, Eugene Berger saw my act, yeah. my, my worst night and I'm so thankful he did. It was it was my worst night of performing. And he came up to me afterwards. He said, "We should talk." And I was crushed. <laughs> I was crushed, but it, it turned out to be the best thing. And he, the advice he gave me was, "You're not special," and it was the best advice I could have got. And he's like, "Who are you? What are you about?" And just like the next few months, uh, I just was writing and thinking, and it became like I'm a science teacher who's also a magician. And so I brought that onto stage, and it. Um, so that was kind of my biggest obstacle that thankfully I've kind of come into a new, uh, a new area of life because of it. So uh, thank you, Eugene. And <laughs> well, I don't know if he would want me looking up or down. He's pretty skeptical. Anyway, uh, so, well, thank you, Eugene, to the universe um, and all that. So, um, and thank you for having me here. This was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. There have been so many interesting ideas in this webinar. I think personally, one of the things that I uh, really found very, very important was when uh, Richard mentioned that um, maybe people shouldn't be just thinking, okay, there's a magic trick going on in a classroom, there's something else. Personally, when I did uh, magic, I just was presenting a story you know, a story about whatever topic I want uh, my students to learn. And so for them, it just uh, took the focus just on the magic and more on the story. And I understand that the brain is very keen on stories. When we are hearing a story, it's like we tend to be gossipers by nature. So we want to know who is involved, who are the protagonists, etc. So for me, this thing about presenting something, not as magic per se, but as something else, a story or something, I think is, is, is very important to, to actually make this combination between magic and education work. 
So guys, thank you very much for being here. I think it's been wonderful, uh, everything that you've shared with us, the questions from the audience. Thank you so much uh, to everyone who participated in making these interesting questions. Thank you.